Secondly, who would buy some homework? No. Not on Halloween. <laughs> oh, it's special topic for watching. Um, we're going to watch the War of the World radio. Mm -hmm. Panic in 1938, Halloween day. Really cool story. So, homework, but you have a few days to do it. I just run into class. Okay, so your homework. 379 to 3... 379 to 389 in America and 409 to 419. Oh, I was going to do all the second period now. So literally start. I started reading this thing by Thomas Piketty about uh, um, economic inequality, and then next thing I know, my study all ended. Bonds coming to people. Halloween. Oh, perfect. <laughs> It's supposed to be 40, it's supposed to be 40 to 50 below tonight. Plus, it's supposed to be like 30. It's gonna be pretty nice. So I did not put this up here. What's the date today? The 31st? Yeah. So I'll write this up right now. 379 to 389, 409 to 419. And this is due on Friday. <laughs> and we're going to have a much more difficult quiz on Friday. It'll be the same. And I'll finish this for Halloween for special topics. That'll be good. All right. So did we get to this? Did we get to... Oh, who invented... What allowed for companies to get bigger because of communication? Telegram. Who invented the steel tip plow? John Deere. Who invented the mechanical reef? Who? McCormick. And wouldn't that be a great Halloween costume? Yes. To come up to the mechanical reef? Who thought of that? There's still time, people. No, think about. No. Not bad songs for the night, early 1980s, but not horrible. See, think about a mechanical reaper. Think about how the hallway would just clear up. Okay, really not right now. Well, because you're good little workers. Did we get to... So we got railroads, we get here. We got economics. All right, so let's do capitalism. We're going to start capitalism right now. Huh? My idea? I wasn't even around yet. I don't look old, but I'm not quite there. I, I'm ageless. There's no photographic evidence of my childhood, so I could be any time at all. <laughs> Oh, free market. So what, Koch, what Adam Smith wrote about was idealized free market. And you notice I put in quotes. Now, when I mean market, I mean a, a, a plate or a, basically the interaction of where people buy and sell goods, where producers can enter the market at will, free to enter it. Buyers, consumers can buy. They're free to come and go. Those who supply the goods, they might laugh, they might go out of business, etc. Everything is open, everything is transparent. There's no free market unless you know all the information about what you're buying or what you're producing. By the way, has a free market like this ever existed? Never in the history of, of humankind. Maybe tomorrow. No, it's never existed. We do not have, we never have complete transparency. There's never a free market. There's always something to manipulate the market, always. So people say, I, I believe in the free market, they believe in the banks. But, He's talking about the idealized one. So we got to look at what he said. Um, if you want to know what an idealized free market is, go to Somalia. And then you also learn how fast it quickly falls apart. 
because because somebody with a gun always ruins it. All right. So first off, in a market, people enter enter either to sell or buy goods. They're in their own. It's in competition, and they're in for their own self interest, and they want money. They want wealth in some kind. I put a dollar sign, but they want some kind of tangible wealth. Money's a placeholder for wealth. They want something about this. And don't forget, we can't have a free market too because government sets money. You know, there's so many different variables, but this is the basic element. So we all have self-interest. You know, when you go into a store to buy something, you want to get the best price for the best quality. All of you, for the most part. And the same thing, people selling it. They want to make the maximum profit out of it, but still maintain or stay in business. And what sets the price is the interaction of supply and demand. If more consumers want a product, what happens to the price? Goes up or vice versa, if less people want it. If you have a product that people want, price goes up. This is the most generic basic supply and demand. It's called the supply and demand curve. No, it does not really look like this. It's any market. So this could be the car market, <laughs> you the dry eraser board market, or of course, the ubiquitous frozen concentrated orange juice market, right? That's the market we care about. And so, and it works like this. Here's the supply curve. And if the price is low on frozen concentrated orange juice, they don't produce very much. But as the price goes up, You'll notice the supply goes up. If price goes up, that'll encourage people to sell more. That'll encourage people to expand or more competitors to enter the market to sell. If the price goes up or vice versa, price goes, price drops, people go out of business, people produce less. Watch it. Now, once again, it is not a straight curve. That's not the way it works. This is generic. Demand, same deal. If the quantity is low, the price is high because people will bid the price up because there's not very many being sold. But as the price or as the uh, supply of it goes up, the demand for it begins or the price for the demand begins to drop. The same deal. More product, price drops. Somewhere in the middle, it will find this equilibrium. And Adam Smith had a name for this. And he said, it can't really be set in an idealized free market. It just kind of has to happen. And he called this <laughs> the invisible hand of the market. The invisible hand of the market. This equilibrium of supply and demand. That's, that's the price for everything in the market. In the idealized Free market. Now that did not exist, and there's elements that exist today, but it still never fully existed. And he should add that he didn't like all these people who are greedy and are in the market. That's what he called them. <coughs> he, did, can you read that? The natural selfishness and rapacity of business people. Greed, vileness of business people. I found that fascinating. He didn't like them. But at the same time, he thought that self interest was what's crucial. And so, if there's competition, there's risk. There's risk for the consumer. But since we're talking about the industrialization, let's talk about you know, business, or let's talk about those who produce the goods. Because industrial revolution, the big thing is that change and produce. There's a lot of risk. I mean, anybody who knows this, if you want, went out and started to want to start a business, or you know somebody, or a family member has started a business, how scary and risky it is. And you invest your money and can't compete for whatever reason, you can lose everything. This is very, very risky. And so, a couple of things about it. First off, everybody wants money. In the business world, this is called profit margin. Profit and revenues minus cost. Most of you do that intuitively. But this is important. Revenue is the amount of money you bring in, cost is the cost of producing. What can you control? If you're in competition with somebody else, so you and somebody else are selling frozen concentrated orange juice, you're in competition. What would you want to do? 
But you can't lower the price that much. If you lower the price, you don't make money. Let's backtrack. What sets the price? Supply and demand. You can't lower or you can't raise price either. But you're really kind of stuck unless you have something like a like a monopoly. So somebody said it already. What can a business control? They can't control a price in an idealized market. What are we doing? I don't know either. What can you control? You can't control the price. So what can you control? Your own supply. You can't really control that either. You supply. Somebody said. Because supply, you still have to, let's say you get raw materials, you still have to pay the market raw materials. So you only have limited amount, but you can control some of your costs. What can you do to lower your cost? Can you lower wages? Well, in a market, wages are decided on what's called the wage system. Can you lower wages? No. Because if you lower wages, what do your workers do? They leave and go to another company. In an idealized free market. Now, I'm going to be clear about it. Has this existed? Not really. But what sets wages? If your profit goes up, what happens to your wages? It has no effect. Profit goes down, no effect. How about skill? Does skill of the worker decide wages? No, not at all. Unless that skill's in demand. How about hard work? Nope, doesn't decide it at all. I gave you a hint. Skill, Dominic seems to know back there, so it's Dominic. What does skill do to work? Yeah, exactly. Because people would organize, they would do, negotiate a deal called the guild. Very right. That's correct. But not anymore. Skill only affects wages if it is in demand. What sets wages? The market. Supply and demand. Skill, I mean, you can have, if you're very skilled, and a lot of people have the same skill, your wages will go down or be steady. It's a better way to look at it. And even if you're the most skilled person in the world, if that skill is in a demand, if you were the greatest ever at making wooden shoes, you can make a wooden shoe that is just beautiful. Would that affect your wages? No, because nobody wants wooden shoes. That's your Dutch. And so, do you see the issue here? How about hard work? Who's had a job where they had a wage? Hey, did a W-2, got a wage, got to work, you filled that out, work with other people. Most of you, I'd say about half of you have had this. And so you work with other people. What are you paid? Were you paid the same as other people in there? Let me ask you this. Did you work with somebody who made the same or even more than you and they did nothing? Yes. Oh, let me rephrase that. Or you were the person who did nothing and got paid the same. <laughs> no. And they're paid the same. Why? Wages are set by the market. You could be the hardest worker in the world, but there's a lot of unemployed people out there your wages are set. <clears throat> and profit, companies could be losing money. But if there's a shortage of workers, they have to raise wages. Companies can make money hand over fist and they'll cut, they can cut wages. Profit has no effect on wages, period, in the market, period, none. Now, you might say, you know, companies might say, oh, you're a hard worker, so I might keep your raise and keep you around. That's the key. 
it'd be more expensive because of supply and demand to train somebody new. That's why. And so in an idealized market, wages are set by something else. So that means something else that's kind of frightening for workers. You go from working when you want and doing what you want and how hard you work really depends your wage to the harder I work, how does that affect my wages? Does it directly affect it? But the harder you work, who, who does it affect? Because of the profits. This is a real hard thing for people to accept. We accept it now and okay, of course I'll get a I'll get a wage. I just we accept it. It was really hard for people to accept. I work harder and somebody else gets richer. That's hard to accept. And so, what's another way then? If wages can't be directly set, oh sure, you're a monopoly, but we're not in a monopoly yet. You become more efficient. Productivity is the amount you get amount of production per worker. And wouldn't you like to get more production per worker if you're a company owner? <laughs> Adam Smith came up with division, uh, this he did not invent it, but he wrote about the division of labor. This is actually an illustration from Adam Smith's book. And it's about making pins. When I mean pins, I mean like a, a pin for soap, a little steel pin. Now in 1776, when he wrote that book, can you imagine how hard it would be to make a pin? We, we don't even think about it. If you want a pin, you go buy a pin. But what do you have, what skills do you need to have to make a pin? P-I-N. So you have to make it's called pottery. You have to be able to make steel. Who in here can make steel besides me? Only if, no. No one can make steel. And for that matter, would you even know what to do with iron to control the heat? So you got to know how to make steel. What else do you need to know how to do? Okay, I made steel. Now what? Yeah, you have to know how to make a mold you can use, which is not an easy thing to do. In fact, how do you make a mold? Sand. Uh, when they would make it, they would make it out, out of sand and superheat the sand at that time. What else do you need? You got to know how to very carefully shave it to make sure it's good unique edges. All the whole process of it, to make steel to the whole process, to make pins, very difficult. Now imagine learning all those skills along. When he said division of labor, we have one person who becomes really good at puddling the steel, one per person very good at molding, one person who understands, can use, understand the heat and be able to pour the molten steel into the mold, breaking the mold without breaking the pin and shaving it, that whole process. If you do one thing, you can become very good at it, can't you? Say it again. Yeah. We're coming to like an assembly line. You do one thing over and over again. It might be mind-numbingly boring and, and awful work, but you become very good and efficient at it. Division of labor makes you more efficient. You have everybody learn one skill. We have the beginning of specialization. Now, whatever about that. How will machines change that? You have machines do it. Then you become very efficient. If you become more efficient, what happens to your costs? And therefore, you can drop your costs. What can you do to the price you sell if your costs drop? You can lower it, undercut your competitor. Does that make sense? And still make money. And then when your competitor is out of business, what can you do? Ideally, what is your goal? To limit the competition, right? If you limit the competition, now in a free market works with free competition, but you want to get rid of the competition and create something that operates like, you guys said it, operates like a what? A monopoly. If you get something that <laughs> operates like a monopoly, then you can set the price but you can not just set the price. That's out too. If you're the only person hiring workers, what can you do to wages? Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a significant problem in the job I have. There's only really one entity that hires wages and private, private education actually pays lower. Pays a lot lower than public, a lot lower, like half. 
And so there's only one person hiring. What's it like for most people working today? If anybody wants to get into computer science, you'll find out there's only a few companies on. It's a problem. And that, that skill is in relative demand, but it also artificially keeps wages low. Now, it doesn't mean it's a bad job or a good job. That's not even the point. We're talking about wages. And so, what is government policy? Because this is what matters is government policy. He's writing about what should government do, because he understands government control is a monopoly. Now, he saw things like the East India Company. Remember the monopoly on tea? And he said, government interference in competition always will be for a monopoly. They will help one business. They will pick a winner. Remember Thomas Jefferson? I told you about his views and fearful of big government in Hamilton. And he was kind of right. Governments give people, companies monopoly. We see this time after time. When everybody's power bill is going to go up by nearly 30% next year, you can see how monopolies function. Northwestern Energy is going to raise energy. We're going to raise electricity and natural gas by almost 30%. Which, by the way, that's a lot. And they just raised it 25% uh, a year and a half ago. Why? There's bonuses to be made. They have a monopoly. Their CEO got a $4 million bonus. I mean, we got to help them out. But, so he says, no government interference, no monopolies. That's where we get the term laws I fair. Remember I told you that for Thomas Jefferson? That is where it came from. Laissez faire or laws I fair because I'm an American. Hands off by government. Oh, this is supposed to be all things being equal, not all this. <laughs> all things being equal. I didn't realize I wrote that. Let me change that so I don't forget. Let me change that so I don't forget. There we go. All things being equal. Now I gotta be clear about it. That means there's no big difference in size of the producers. Consumers are all generally the same. Everybody has transportation. That will lead to competition. Well, let the market decide. If everybody's operating their own self-interest, they'll come up with the best price, the best quantity. In fact, I'll give you a few things. If there's competition, what happens to price? What happens to quality of goods? What happens to efficiency? If there's if there's competition, what happens to prices? The prices It'll keep prices low. You have to produce better products. So quality has to go. Because if you put out trash, your competitors will undercut you. They'll put out good products, even average products. And then, of course, efficiency. Everybody's got to get more efficient and produce better. That's what you have for competition. But companies don't want competition because competition is risk. Adam Smith wrote all about this. It's kind of a remarkable book. This is why you want competition. By the way, do we have much competition in the United States today? No. We have almost no competition. We're all monopolies. It's really becoming a problem, especially we're starting to see really bad in technology, seeing cars, those issues. Have you seen the trash they put off for movies? There's, there's no competition. There's only four companies making movies of the big ones. I'm, and if you like uh, what, the superhero ones, which I've never seen, the Marvel ones, that's fine, but they're all the same. You like them? But they're all the same. I know you, you're a fan. So, but let's not forget, Adam Smith wrote this pre-capitalism. He wrote this in 1776. What else happened in 1776? And, yeah, Declaration of Independence. That's Adam Smith's grave. So if you go to Edinburgh, you got to make the uh, the pilgrimage. The same day I went, saw Adam Smith's grave and took a picture. The same day I didn't buy a kilt. Did I tell you that story? So we went to the store and they had these these kilts. We're in Edinburgh, Scotland, and it's right. It was right near his grave, and they had this kilt, black watch plaid kilt, and I was going to buy it. Now the thing was, we're in. 
touring, great tour in the United Kingdom. So I think it was 250 pounds. So that at the exchange rate, that's about it was about 400 dollars. Whoa! And I of course was going to buy it, and I I wanted to buy it, and my wife brought up a very valid point. Do you know what the valid point was? Yeah. No. When would I ever wear a kilt? Now I of course responded with every day, but then she talked me out of it, and now I don't have the cool kilt. So. Let's get back to competition. Capitalism would change everything. I think we have division of labor, competition, cost, trying to create monopoly, all this stuff happening. A few more things then. So let's say people started buying the capital, the machines. Think of the risk now. Machines aren't cheap. You have to buy a lot. Usually that means you have to borrow money, which means debt, which means significant issues. Now we're talking about how capitalism started. We're talking about, this is 1830s, 1840s in the United States. This is talking about why we are the way we are. It started here. This gave us our world. Machines are really expensive. Who can afford the machines? Do you see what's happening? With the machines and with the push towards limited competition, fewer and fewer people can afford to get in the market. Is it a free market? It's not quite free anymore, even if it's idealized. Well, this comes up to the key term, economy of scale. Remember the division of labor? Let's say you could afford to have all these people by hand making a pin. Now let's take the next step bigger and you have machines do it. You have greater costs in the beginning, but aren't you significantly more efficient? Can't you produce a lot more? Economies of scale is the iron rule of economics, period. The iron rule. Scale means size. And so put a star by economies of scale, put an asterisk, underline it, un italicize it, put it in big letters, highlight it. Economies of scale means this. In competition, bigger companies are more efficient. The big are more efficient and therefore have a competitive advantage. Big, everyone got this? This is the iron rule of economics. This is a truism. This is a truism for everything. Big has a competitive advantage. Big is more efficient. Now, of course, big companies can screw up and lose their advantage. All you have to do is look at the the big three American car companies in the 1970s. They blew their massive advantage, never got it back. But big have a competitive advantage. Why? If you become more efficient and you're the one who can afford the machines, everybody who can't afford the machines, your competitors, what happens to them? They either got to get bigger or what happens? They go out of business and you suck them, you swallow them up. Big has a competitive advantage. Always, the bigger you are. And if you don't believe me, why don't you go start a store? Let's start a little grocery store and build it right next to Walmart and see how long you last. Walmart is the definition of economies of scale. They can drop their costs because they're so much more efficient. And they can drop their costs, so what can they do to their price? Even massive store, big corporations like Albertson and Safeway, which are by the same people, they can't even near compete. Their prices are going to be higher overall because they're not as big. Efficiency is key. So what's everyone going to do? If you can't cut wages, you... It's a scary movie over there. Okay. Wait, so big all the sun is coming out, people. It kind of ruins a Halloween vibe. The big so what is everyone gonna to try to do? 
No, what is everyone going to try to do? And I'm trying to figure out what you're trying to say. What does every company try to do? Get bigger. Everyone wants to try to get bigger. You can only cut costs so much. You can only, and if you make shoddy products, people won't buy it, potentially. But if you can get big, everything changes. So what we're going to have almost immediately is getting bigger. And what do they want to create? Size. But the problem with size is that's more risk, isn't it? So they're going to have to figure out ways to make new companies and what new companies are going to be created to limit the risk. Corporations. They're going to change everything. And if it's more risk, what kind of people can enter the market? Fewer and fewer and fewer people. Every time there's more risk, fewer people can enter the market. And as population grows up, goes up, that's even a smaller percentage of the population. Capitalism has this incentive to increase size. And so, in a market, what happens to the number of companies? If it's just left alone, what will happen? Every time, <coughs> will it go up or go down? Yeah. Fewer and fewer companies. And therefore, in a company, I told you profits have nothing to do with wages. Who gets all the profit? The owner. And if there's fewer companies, what does that create? The market by definition promotes inequality. Wealth is gonna focus to the top really fast. Here is the wealth of the richest 1%, and this is in the United States in the 19, or 19th century, and you see it peak with the peak of the Industrial Revolution. Wealth is going to focus to the top. Not as much in other places, and it's happening here again. But, is that bad? Can be. It limits demand, it, uh, it creates inequalities in the political system. Vast inequalities help lead to revolution. Vast inequalities um, help lead to like the rise of Nazi Germany, things like that. But also, if you see somebody doing well, what does that encourage you to do? Yeah, to take a risk. And so there's, it's, it's questionable what happens here. But here's the next big question. Who benefits from laws like that? If government does nothing with competition, who will win? Monopolies. Scale will win. Always scale will win. And what happens as soon as scale wins? What happens to prices? They might not skyrocket if it's for something that people don't absolutely need, but prices will begin to go up. What happens to quality? Dramatic. I mean, I still can't believe how many people spent so much money on Apple phones when the quality has dropped dramatically. I should add, I um, watches, I, um, Apple watches are gone. Huh? Yeah. Apple, Apple has a patent issue. They might lose, so there might be no more Apple watches. Here. Wait, what? Hmm? They've lost a lawsuit over a patent. So, there is a role. Of Adam Smith did not believe in total laws I fair. Adam Smith believed this. There's a role of government, and it's anti-monopoly. It's got to keep companies from getting too big. In the United States, and I'll tell you why around Christmas, that is called antitrust. <laughs> Any monopoly, they've got to keep companies from getting too big. If companies get too big, there's no competition. Because capitalism, the market has this, it's capitalism that accelerates, has a desire to get rid of the market because of this competition. So you got, government's got to step in and be antitrust or anti monopoly. But who reads that part? If, yeah, a little bit of Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt is interesting. I mean, and nobody did more anti monopoly than his cousin Franklin. Nobody. Teddy Roosevelt was even the same ballpark. But beginning in 1980, we've done nothing about antitrust, any monopoly. And that's why we have monopolies. 
the Biden administration is the first administration since, ironically, Richard Nixon to really aggressively do anti-monopoly. But still, we're so concentrated. Right now, for example, the U.S. government is suing Google for being a blatant monopoly. Yeah. And yeah, they're suing Google and Amazon. Because yeah. they're both monopolies. Amazon is a shocking monopoly. So, who read this part? Nobody. And if you were big, what do you like? Not that. You want laws I fair. If you're big, you want laws I fair. And that's going to lead to a couple things. First off, socialism would develop out of this. Socialism would look at the things that Adam Smith said and say that capitalism is inherently flawed. It creates too much of inequality of wealth. Now, I got to be clear about one thing. There's going to be all kinds of different socialists, and nobody hates each other more than other groups of socialists. I'm not making that up. They, like, the, the democratic socialists in Germany despise the communists in Germany and vice versa, and that helped lead to Hitler too. So, their mortal enemy, Hitler. And so, capitalism, yeah, Hitler was rapidly in the socialist. That was kind of the whole idea of this part. Capitalism, a market economy, therefore, has two classes. Two classes. And what do we have in these two classes? But first on the bot, I made the print small because I wanted to. You have the capitalist. Uh, sometimes you see them called the bourgeoisie. That's another term for middle class, French middle class would start kind of the market in the 18th century. And they take all the risk and they get all the profit. And you can understand why they want to control the factories. If they're taking the risk, wouldn't you want to control it? I mean, it makes sense. Is that fair? That's another argument. And then you have labor. Sometimes you see them called the proletariat. So this is from medieval France. This is from, you don't know where the term proletariat comes from. The Roman Empire. The Roman Empire. The proletariat with the lower class. You may know the upper class in Rome. The plebeians. We have, and they both want the same thing. Profit, they, the, the uh, bourgeoisie, the capitalist, wants them to work hard, and that increases their profit. They want a piece of the profit, but wait, the wage system is not profit-based. Do you see why workers might want something called a labor union? And a few more things then. When I mention inequality, the inequality is kind of huge. A graph disappears. Um, I showed you this one, the rising wealth up to 1920. Here's what it looks like in the United States now. This is the, the wealth of the top 1%. This is the Great Depression, and here's the top of the 1% going back up. Why? Monopolies. There's more monopolies now. Well, who accumulates at the top? That's just the way monopolies work. And so let's jump right to here. 10. What we have is last thing, two things you'll write down today. A new economic policy, laissez faire economics. And this is very much Hamilton. And what they would say is hands off for competition, let the market decide. You start hearing this in the 1840s, 1850s, by the 1890s, that's all people would say hands off, hands off. Let the market decide. Sink or swim on your own merit. Why? Because if economies of scale, laissez faire favors the big. But here's the caveat. Here's that second thing you got to get. But they also want massive government aid. So government aid to big business and wealthy. Remember Hamilton, but now Henry Clay's American system. Give money to railroads, give money to manufacturing. If, if the government builds roads, that's <coughs> massive government aid for business. Now that's not necessarily good. That's not necessarily bad. But if you're helping business, and then at the same time, letting the big win. Wow, will they win. Oh, and lastly, immigration. Encourage immigrants. Immigrants in the short run do what to wages? In the short run. In the long run, they actually increase the market and increase wages. Immigrants bring a lot of innovation. If you don't believe me, go on.
immigrants have brought so much innovation to food in the United States, it's not even fun. And on that happy note, I want all of you to leave and ponder. Now, think about what innovation brought us. On your way out, think about innovation on your way out. What products should you be thinking of? Drugs. This drug right here. Look at the rug, everybody. So, oh, if you if you're gonna make up, you're you quite the task. After school over there, you showed an image of it. I haven't seen it in person yet. It's yeah. beautiful. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Like, we need to We need to stay up. Play in Lisbon until midnight. This is the midnight I don't know if there's other people. Oh, God. Uh, I'm going to need some help. Yeah, Clear out. I'm always waiting for you. Three. You need to just get out of here. Yeah. Hey guys, let's take a quiz. against my spryness, my quickness, my intelligence. I have math and, I have a math degree and a math degree. 
I was going to put it in second period, but I uh, ended up reading something by uh, an economist by the name of Thomas Piketty. I was involved. <laughs> Once I said, oh, yeah, this may be very cool. Uh, it was just my friends. Yeah, no, you guys just, I, I changed my mind. You guys are going to be 20 minutes. So I'm just going to read out the random work case. I'll call it. No, no, no. I'm going to get them all. So, if I don't. <laughs> yeah, any questions, please ask. Yeah. Oh, ask me that. Let's get the quiz started. Save the question. Jot it down so you don't forget. Are you ready? Are we ready? One to five. And here's the best part about the quiz. I have good news for all of you. It only involves court cases. Did I show you this? Is this the court case? Uh -huh. Oh, where'd it go? It's a spelling quiz. Oh, no. Here we go. One of those court cases is not like the others. Does it help if I turn the lights off? How about on? How about this? We take a bonus question. Don't make that sound. Bonus question. What was the name of the first workable steam locomotive? Okay, I had a name, the song. A pizza. It's free pizza. When you're done, turn it over. Draw that said steam locomotive. But who's the engineer? Or maybe the goal of the British is right. Okay. There's no three point line on that. Colors are blue and gold, which are, which are better in capitals. I gotta say. Capitals, colors, okay. <laughs> you know, whatever. All right, who's still working on the quiz? Who's still working on the train? Let's go, let's go around. Come on. This first workable steam locomotive. Thank you. 
You done? All right, let's grade it. Joint pass to the person in front of you. Those in front pass to the rear. Number one, the Baltimore and Ohio. Number two, the Milwaukee. Number three, the Norfolk and Southern. Number four, the Frisco. And of course, number five, the Santa Fe. Those are all just railways. How about the uh, R F and P, the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac? All these railways. One of them are gone too. Number one, E. Two, A. Three, D. Four, F. Five, C. Bonus. The rocket. Take the total number one, subtract from five, turn it over, let's grade the, the, the rocket. And what animal, when you think of railroads, what animal do you think of? The mongoose. Out of four mongoose. I couldn't think of what. No mongoose. That's a negative three mongoose. Hey, we're going to say the bonus. I just thought it was the bonus. You, you, you all right. <laughs> I hand it back. Let's look at your score. Oh, <laughs>